Okay, so so welcome guys, welcome everyone. So what, what what's happening is that we we just came together as a group of young people that would like to uh, speak about issues that are pertaining to gender-based violence. And as we are speaking about these issues, uh, this is just for us to raise, not to just raise an, awen an awareness, but to to have people having these conversations in our spaces of of, com uh, of comfortability in lack of a better word. And um, with us being in this space, you know, for me, it's it's more about, I've got a young sister and to, to think that I cannot be silent about these issues now and, and wait for the time when my young sister is the one that gets into a situation like that. Like what has happened to, to girls like Ui Nene that happened last year, you know, and, and girls like um, the Tsejo Paso that Uli, that's happened today, I mean, uh, this year. And looking at a whole lot of other different girls that these this issues have happened to. Um, for me, it's like, I cannot be silent now, right? And wait until someone close to me gets, gets involved in, in a situation like this. Uh, so this is why we are here together, trying to create an opportunity for us to change the and change and create a change for the next generation to come after us as well. So yeah, <clears throat> this is the issue. These are the issues that we have. Uh, there's gender-based violence. What can we do about them? How can we change the narrative that's going around? How can we make a difference in this life? Mm -hmm. um, I just want to say, that I think that, you know, the whole problem of gender-based violence is something that is like very deeply rooted in, you know, the South African society because, um, you know, South Africa is a, a country with a lot of different cultures, you know, these like 11 official languages. Um, so that obviously just by default implies that like we are very culturally rooted people. And in our culture, there is, um, patriarchy that is evident in the culture. I mean, like I'm Zulu, so I can mostly speak for my culture that in like the traditional rituals and that stuff, even as far as, you know, how the family structures are at home, the, the gender roles, um, it just always puts men in a position to kind of, you know, be um, superior to women. Um, and, you know, in a more social setting like even like amongst your friends and stuff there is um this i don't know if this is a new thing but like rape culture you know there's there's rape and there's rape culture where obviously rape is like the the blatant you know rape but also just the culture of like catcalling and you know being you know overly persistent and thinking that a no is a yes those type of things that are tolerated in small social settings you know, actually carries the, the bigger problem. Because if we tolerate that, then, uh, you know, catcalling can be, you know, actually, you know, acted upon and, you know, you can actually become attacked and not just, you know, call. So I think it's, it's just a vast culture in social settings, um, at home, in your culture, and the most difficult part is people don't question their culture. You know, you don't ever criticize it or, you know, just evaluate what um, societal defects that it would have. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you know, that's just my take on it. But then would you say, um, <clears throat> would you say Cat Collin as well? Um, if maybe, let me, let me speak as a naive man um, mm -hmm. and say, if, if you're going to say Cat Collin is kind of like the wrong way of yeah. doing things, then is it wrong? So basically, you would be saying it's wrong for me to to admire you and say, "Oh, look, you're beautiful," and stuff like that. Um, and I mean, it's it's all about context because it's it's different if you like politely tell me that I'm beautiful, um, you know, compared to you um, just feeling, you know, because it's it's like 
catcalling obviously is like a negative thing like it, just yeah. a girl walking down the street and men can just be like yo i tap that type thing and uh, lack of like the lack of respect um yeah. and just uh diminishing women to like you know your worth or whatever or how beautiful you are is dependent on what i want to do with you you know whether i can undress you with yeah. my eyes um that type of thing okay and um does anyone else want to add on to Dimbo. Am I being kicked out? <laughs> I don't mind. <laughs> I don't mind. Um, yeah. I, I basically agree with uh, what to Nomalanga has been saying. Um, mm. That it's it is a deep rooted issue within uh, the South African culture, um, mm. and it is unfortunate because year after year you still get uh, young boys who are being taught this. Um, even now it's 2020, but we still have young boys who are being taught. You know what? You you are the most powerful person in the house. Your wife mustn't disrespect you. Mustn't disrespect you. Your mm. girlfriend mustn't you know do all this this and that. Um, you you have the right to do whatever you want to her, basically. You know, you you kind of own her, um, and I think that has to that has to stop. Um, in terms of the cat calling, yeah, there's a way to do it and there's a way not to do it. You know, just whistling to a girl walking by the street or wherever, and you know the way that people actually look at her. Mm -hmm. Never mind whistling. Just the look that you give her, you know, um, that says a lot about you as a person as well. And it is unfortunate that we even said we see it in our youth today. Um, yeah. I think we we are in a position of of being able to change the perspective for our youth, mm. um, teaching them what respect is, uh, how to look at people, how to treat people or how to talk to people. Um, so I think we are at, in a position of influence as leaders. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and, but like, um, don't you think maybe the, the, the issue comes in when we, we look at the way we are taught that women are basically objects and not human beings? Because um, if we look at um, whistling at a, at a girl, that just meet in the streets, I'd whistle at a car and say, wow, that car's beautiful, you know? Um, but I'm looking at it as an object, right? And I'm already thinking in my head, thinking of, oh, when I drive that car, when, you know, and then when you look at women as well, we tend to look at them in that sense as well, as men. So <clears throat> we, to, to the guys, now, how then can we change that way of, uh, that narrative that we have, that perception of that women are an object. James. <laughs> Not James, yeah. <laughs> it's only JR, yeah. What are you talking about? Uh, so uh, I think it's a very rooted question. Uh, and we've we've spoken about a number of the things that uh, could possibly be rooted in. We've got uh, we've mentioned a little bit about tradition, so our country's tra tradition, um, and like cultural differences, etc. Um, I think another thing that plays a huge factor in this conversation uh, around gender-based violence um, is that of the role media plays. So um, media and social media, obviously, to expand it into that. And I think what is allowed and not allowed in those realms and what is portrayed as OK. Um, so for me, I would say that addressing uh, these issues would possibly be expanding the conversation into something bigger uh, and especially with our, our young men that we work with and we're exposed to um, and that, that would be a conversation around uh, toxic masculinity 
Mm. And toxic masculinity basically is all of these things that we've been speaking about of what is perceived as uh, okay or perceived as normal, both by guys with guys, um, but also the world, i.e. media, blah, blah, blah. And so I think really addressing the, these issues would, would start with um, asking questions like that of what is okay, what is not okay, um, and creating awareness about it. But I think what you, uh, someone said earlier, uh, part of the issue is that a, a large portion of people standing up and having the conversation isn't actually men. And mm -hmm. I think part of the issue with that is because um, it's tricky. Like as a man uh, who has also grown up in that same environment with the media and that same uh, social norm, uh, mm -hmm. looking at it going, okay, maybe this needs to change. You actually don't necessarily know where you're right and where you're wrong. Um, but so, very long-winded, but I think the, the short answer would be uh, to start a conversation and to really start to create awareness of what could possibly be uh, seen as negative and what is positive. Yes, yes, yes. But, and, and, I think, and I think the other thing is that because we've been brought up in a society that says, you know, men cannot speak especially as young men, we cannot speak about certain issues and us not speaking about these certain issues, it's, it's, looked, at, it's looked upon as a taboo. And then um, if it's issues about women, then we, they're like, ah, oh, no, wait, you know, step back. You, you cannot talk about that. You don't know um, where you are. And at the same time, if we, if we are silent, we are still told the same thing. You shouldn't be silent. You should speak. This is where you're supposed to speak up, right? And I could speak in, in the sense of that, um, like for me, uh, just during the time when I had, when I was at my, at my grand, granddad's funeral and in, in our culture, as you know, we, we, we take a long time to get to the to the burial time and we keep having the the, the, the gatherings that we have and at that point it, the first half of the gatherings I, I was given the role of representing the family but and then when it came to the second half I was told I'm too young to be representing the family and then sometime this year we had an issue in the family that we had to address and then I was told as well, like, no, this is when you're supposed to speak, you know? And I think that's where the problem is, where we, we, we are given this, mind, this, this mindset of these things are taboo, you cannot speak about them, you should speak about them at this point or speak about them at this point. And, and then, you know, it's kind of like you, you are... Uh, uh, lack of a better word it's like there's, there's a stipulation of when you speak <laughs> and when not to speak type of thing you know um well, what's your thoughts mr tk um can you hear me yes sir good evening everyone um you know what I, i'm busy thinking here and i'm what, what comes to mind is that I think we, as, as young men and as men, um, regardless in culture of, or out of culture, we need to start um, re-educating ourselves on our role as men in the different spheres that we find ourselves in. Um, if you look at culture, for example, and I'll use mine, Mine as one. There are aspects of, of, of culture, of my culture, that has uh, educated me to be patriarchal in how I see things. Mm. Um, but if you look at it, it is through the, uh, the, the what's the word? The, 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 the person is through the person that educates 
educates me, um, that, that guides me, um, and not through the actual culture itself. Um, yeah. For example, in, in Sesotho, we, if we, we, if I were to add on to your example, if, if, if I were to represent a family as yeah. such, I am told that as a young man, my role is to, is to facilitate mm. the gatherings, but not to lead it, you know? And that is being led by, by, by men. And the question that always arises in my head is, how many families are raised by single mothers? How many mm. young mm. men are, are not brought up by a father and don't have a father figure in their lives? And now, if we're going to say that this stance of patriarchy that you have been taught um, is the way of culture, and you get a man who did not have a, um, a mentor or a father in their life, and we meet, we are going to get to a, a stage where we are calling each other, you're not man enough, or um, this is not how men operate. Mm. And that's where I think the the problem should start. At. It, it's we need to address things from the root. Mm. Um, mm. This is this is a a broader um, problem. Um, mm. The fact that young boys are growing up without fathers, it's a problem. Um, because if I have this patriarchal or this, um, yeah, this patriarchal mindset, and I come and mentor you, Elvis, yeah. who has no father figure in your life, I'm obviously going to just pour you poison um, yeah. because my head is filled with poison. And so we need to go to the cracks and the roots of, of, of patriarchy. And, 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 and that's, that, that also has to do with the fact that our families are broken. And we need to some, in some form of way, to rebuild those nuclear and you know those those foundations of family. Mm. My yeah. that's my two yeah. cents. And um, just to to uh, Kaira, um, I want to ask a question yeah, with which which is, um, basically, directed at at women or girls, in, in the sense of that. You know, you get into a, 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 actually, I was having a conversation this afternoon with a friend of mine, and we were talking about that. You know, sometimes we can talk about these issues of how people get, you know, abused and, 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 and the whole scenario of the gender-based violence. And then, now, how then do we explain uh, the, way, uh, a, 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 the way a girl would intimidate a guy? to get to the point where, because men, uh, we, we have this masculinity that we have in us. And if you keep pushing and pushing and pushing, we end up fighting against you pushing us or if you intimidate us. So like, for example, if maybe we, we, we are dating and then I have, we have a fight and with that fight that we're having, you come and you, you take my PlayStation and it's a PlayStation <laughs> 5 and then you take it and you break it, right? And you chuck it out the, the, the balcony, you know? And at that point, I'm feeling intimidated and you like, come, what you gonna do? In my mind, the first thing I'm gonna do is slap you or something like that, you know? <laughs> Cause I'm feeling intimidated, oh <laughs> intimidated. So what do you say about that situation where sometimes we might blame guys for hitting a girl, but what about the girls who intimidate the guys in order for them to get hit? Jeez, like, <laughs> that's not an easy answer. Um, I mean, any act of violence towards someone is, is wrong. Yeah. You know, um, oh, my word. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for someone to damage someone else's property, that, that's bad. That's already yeah. wrong. But it, it's still not right to get violent towards a woman or towards anyone in that manner. Um, 
Oh my word. Okay. But but, but like think, uh, yeah. yeah. Continue. No, no, you continue. <laughs> but like when, when is it right? When is it wrong? Uh, because for me it's like you get you get intimidated, you get um you get threatened. It's you 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 you're the one who's already been kind of like got got into the point where because a man is angry and when yeah, yeah. as a human being when you feel weak you become aggressive is it is weak it, or is it feeling emasculated no no weak as a human being when you're weak okay. you become aggressive when you're hungry yeah. you become aggressive when you know you take you take that last um inch of of uh, energy that you have just to to yeah, like, that's yeah. why a lot of people when when people protest they don't protest when they are when they have a good pay or whatever a good salary but they protest yeah. when they don't have the money right yeah, when they're struggling yeah when they're struggling yeah. so the moment you feel weak you start being aggressive so now how then do we expect um men to act in the right manner when a woman has intimidated her or has has done something that has caused her uh, caused him to to act the way he's acted as well um i'd like to i'd like to take this away from man versus woman because yeah. if uh, i'm sure in our ministries if, if all of us are in ministry we've gotten to a point where like we're really angry with our kids we're like <clears throat> So I'm not, I'm not going to lie. Like I've looked at a kid and I'm just like, if I, if I could hit you right now, I probably would. But like, I respect you too much and I love you too much to do that. Mm. You see, I think when we get angry with each other or, you know, man versus woman or woman versus man, um, we need to remember that we love that person. That, and love causes no harm, you know, especially in the Bible, you know, love is patient, love is kind. Yes. Um, I, remember, I remember in one holiday club, I was like, you guys are going to get angry with your kids. You know, to the teenagers, you're going to get angry with your kids. And when, as soon as you get angry, you know, you must recite that 1 Corinthians 12 or 13. I can't remember now. You know, love is patient, love is kind, and all of that until you calm down. Mm-hmm. You know, so I, I think maybe perhaps that is something that we can pass on to this generation to first think before you act. Mm-hmm. Because it's a lot of times when we act out in anger that it causes us so much more problems than if we just stopped and thought about things in that moment you know yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and thinking of that verse it's so long that by the time you you recite the whole verse you'll be you won't be angry anymore yeah, you're just exactly. gonna be like okay let me go home <laughs> i'm cool and you'll, you'll forget what the words are and then you'll forget why you're angry you know? <laughs> yeah yeah and then um uh, directed to uh, at alex uh, another issue that we have is the issue about the a, a man's sex drive or just a human being sex drive we never talk about these things and they're seen as a taboo how then can we place uh, bring out a conversation like this in, in 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 a family so that we can have people more people talking about it in order for them to avoid uh this crimes that are done in, in because of you know, the sexual crimes that have been done? I think, I think that's a very good question. Um, you know, when, when you ask this question, and, and particularly the question just before that, um, you know, I, I just, I, I, and I want to look at, I think it's Kiara's point. Mm-hmm. which was pretty much when you when you read that first right which is um, 1 Corinthians 13 and you read that passage right it's all about love now mm-hmm. the one thing I, i've noticed and and i'm going to drag the point a little bit just to just to sh- explain completely what i think but mm-hmm. when we look at that first right that verse shows us what love really is and what love really does Mm. Now, the problem within our society, unfortunately, is I, I would even go as far to say is not just patriarchy, is not just misogyny, but is actually a lack of love. Right? Mm. Mm. So if, if, I, if I loved you, right, 
as my partner, then mm. I would do my best not to hurt you, correct? Mm. Mm. If I um, truly loved you, then I would be patient with you, right? I would be kind with you. I would, you know, so I think the, the biggest issue, and, and luckily for us, we, we actually have the answer to this whole problem. Um, yes. The answer is love. The answer is Jesus. But the problem we as a society have is we do not have, we do not have love. We do not have, um, we do not live out love in our daily, in our daily walk. Mm. You know, and that's what causes all of that. And and when it comes to, you know, even sexual urges, I would say this. I think even within that, it's a lack of love. And and I'll tell you why I say that. Mm. You know, um as a as a young man, you know, I I I I struggled with that with that sort of thing for for the for the long time and I still do from time to time. But the, the biggest thing that I learned was that the reason we, we struggle so much is because we truly don't know what love is. So we think that, um, you know, and uh, that watching porn, we think that, you know, having sex before marriage, we think that is love. And in actual fact, all of those things are substitutes for the real love, you know? And it's only until I truly got saved and found Christ that I realized that those things will never fulfill me. So we try and do these things because we think they will fulfill me. Now to your, now to your question. I think, you know, the, and also as a society, we don't talk about these things because we, we want to keep them one side. But the one thing that I've learned is anything we try to keep on one side, everything we try to keep quiet and not deal with, becomes a bigger issue in the long run, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I think the, the first thing would be, and, and I would say it even within church, and, and I've said it to a lot of youngsters, let's have these types of conversations, you know, yeah. so that we can get to um, the issues that we are dealing with. And I think, you know, and, and I don't, I don't, I don't want to blame the church in any way, but what I want to say is that I think even within the church, we are so quiet about these things because yes. we are trying to, you know, um, protect something that doesn't really need protecting. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think, you know, that that's the root of what is truly the problem. And if we can deal, you know, if we can better have these conversations and explain to men and women about our sexual urges and what, mm -hmm. and why we are having these issues, then I think truly we would be able to get to the problem of why, you know, men feel entitled to try and touch a woman in a way that she should never have been touched, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yes, yes. But now, at the same time, um, thinking about men having feeling uh, the way you know men having to touch a woman in the way a woman is not supposed to be touched uh then we we look at scenarios where as a young person you are not taught uh you know or with or about all these issues I, I think families as well as parents i feel like parents should talk about these things uh, about sex with their kids at a very young age, so that their kids, you know, the kids do not have to, um, you know, you get these uncles that have, have touched girls in, in, in a very, you know, unbecoming manner, and um, uncles that have touched boys as well, you know, because now, so now the boy, because the, the kid sees uh, chocolate or sees whatever the uncle brings to them, and then they say, oh no, it means that this is actually a normal thing. And then it teaches these girls to grow up and get to a point where they're silent about some of these issues. And as they are silent about these issues, if they're getting abused by their boyfriends, uh, they will not say and wait until it gets out of hand. You know, and, and yet you're seeing that there is certain steps that the boyfriend has taken to get to that point where they abuse her. So how can we then 
try to help parents to get to the point where they can speak about these things. What do you think, Alex? <laughs> I, I think then again, it, it, just becomes a, it just becomes a conversation. And, and you see, this becomes a lot more difficult because this conversation is so, so deeply rooted in culture um, that doesn't allow this conversation, right? So within, like, even within my household, I would say that although, like, I come from, you know, I grew up just with my mom and she would be more willing to have this convers these types of conversations with me. I think that if I had to try and have this conversation with my dad, um, I've seen how my sisters have had that conversation and it hasn't gone on, you know? <laughs> and I think, you know, that's the biggest issue is we, we cannot have these conversations within our own homes because there is some taboo that's like, no, but this person, for the example, using your example of the uncle coming into the house, we almost feel like our parents first listen to the uncle. You know, they almost don't listen to us. They, it's almost like we don't matter and what we think, you know, and even if we, we do say something, it's almost like they take sides at first and then we end up not saying something or they respond, you know, very badly. And then we're like, uh, okay, then we don't tell them in future. So I think, you know, it, it starts off as a culture thing. Yeah. And I think that's what makes it so difficult, I think. Um, if we can, you know, as this generation, as this next generation, have those conversations in our houses um, with our kids and have those conversations with each other, then it will somehow go into our generation. But I think the biggest issue is we want to keep these things quiet because we somehow feel, no, we need to protect something. And, mm -hmm. and I think that's, you know, that's really the issue there. What do you think, Dimpo, about this issue? Um, for me, I think it kind of goes back to what you said about the topics that are taboo within a uh, family, within a group, within uh, society. You know? um, and sex education is one of those um, taboo topics. You know, it, you don't mention it around the house. You don't talk about it. It, do not, it doesn't exist. You know, it doesn't exist until it actually does. Um, but, but then, what can I, we what can we do to make this conversation exist? Because this is an issue that is is hurting a lot of people. And at the end of the day, that's when we're gonna find that we're gonna find more men um, abusing women and more women living in an abusive situation because they have been told it's a taboo. How then can we put it into, into, into parents, put it into this generation to say, listen, we need to talk about these things at home. I think Alex actually touched on it a bit uh, when he, he talked about the root. Mm. You know? Why are we so afraid to talk about it? You know, why? Why is it such a huge issue for us to actually talk about it? I mean, pretty much everybody in life goes through it. So why yeah. is it such an issue to actually talk about it? And I think yeah. once we address that, then we'll be able to be like, okay, actually there's nothing to be afraid of. You know, mm. uh, It's not like I'm going to die just from hearing about this or I'm going to like lose my tongue just from talking about it. You yeah, know? Yeah. Nothing bad is going to happen from talking about it. So why are we so afraid? And I think once we actually find that route, maybe that means talking to parents and actually discussing with them why, then we can find the next step, the next solution as to where we go. And um, um, James, do, do you think talking about these same issues uh, in the, within the context of a church, do you think that would help bring up issues like this in, in, into families as well? Um, I definitely think it, it needs to be a conversation. Uh, I think we all agree on that point. Um, 
I think one of the struggles, especially in the church context, is as soon as you you come at it from maybe the pulpit or like let's say you do a a series on it or you you know you start like a course and you you invite people and so on. I think there's there's a number of issues that arise from it, and I think one of those is everybody's got their own kind of uh, thing going on in their family. So uh, TK I'm touching it a bit, Alex touched, we're all touching it a little bit. Is some households it's taboo, some households, uh, you know, it might not even be like uh, ad- identified in that household. Like there's stuff going on that is perceived as normal. So I can go to a uh, family in my church and I can go to that father or, you know, I can talk to the teenagers and be like, uh, yo, the stuff going on in your house is actually toxic. Like you're learning the wrong thing, mm. but that just comes across as an opinion. Um, the other thing, an issue I think that it, it is faced, especially when it is raised and when uh, something is, uh, you know, like try to be done about it um, mm. with a course or a, a sermon or whatever, it, or, on social media, you start a page or you whatever you TikTok about it or whatever. Um, as soon as somebody says, "I would like help" or "I would like to be a part of this thing," there's a degree to which you're admitting that you're guilty and um, and admitting that there's a problem there. And I think that's a huge thing for people, and that's that's just a people thing. Like it's not even just this topic. I think people, as soon as you announce something or declare something that's going on, uh, that's an issue for you, you're making it a reality. And as soon as it's a reality, you have to deal with it. And I think uh, a large portion of what we're saying is that this topic is so huge and this, this issue is so huge. There's so many facets. There's tradition, there's, there's culture, there's uh, uh, race there's you know there's there's all sorts of um complexities that come with it is uh there's a whole bunch of people trying to find the answer so you're not necessarily going to easily find a solution or an answer but you're going to be faced with a reality that's that's pretty big you know so so do you think um we 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 should then look into kind of toning down on, on the culture factor within our families. And and because for me, I feel like n- not a lot of, of topics that are, are like the elephant in the room are spoken about within our churches, especially, and even from the pulpit side. And if we're looking at that, don't you think that if if churches speak about them from from the pulpit, it will get families to go home and rethink and relook at these issues. Um, what's your take on that, um, TK? Uh, oh, he disappeared. <laughs> Noma. That's what he thinks about it. <laughs> <laughs> and Noma, what do you think? Okay, you muted. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, obviously you can hear me now. Yeah. Um, so, so I think that yeah, our focus has been on you know what's going on at home and what's going on in your culture and everything. And I think that you know there's a few things that people don't question. They don't question their culture. Um, and you could say that you know uh, their their beliefs. You know their the Bible and you know. So I think if we use um obviously church as a way to start the conversation then it it will be easier for people to go home and you know keep it going because if you if you don't feel like that's the initiative that you started by yourself that oh no i'm the only family you know having this conversation um let's rather stop and let's just keep it as taboo as it is already 
um, then it's just going to die down. So if it's like a spontaneous um, thing where it's normalized, where nearly everywhere you go, um, you you find that things aren't swept under the carpet anymore, then it's really going to you know start the mobilization in all aspects and the conversation. Okay. Okay. And, 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 and just to think about uh, what you just said before, when you said um, as, you know, as most families, we don't question culture and all. Uh, I think of that, uh, there's this thing, I think it's predominantly in, in most of our African cultures, you cannot pass the salt, you know, by hand, you place it on the table and then the next person picks it up. And when you question, they say, no, we found it like that. Um, and and yeah. when you question so your grandfather, they'll say, no, it's been like that. So I think we need to, as people, we, we need to start now asking about these things and saying, there's an issue like this. We need to question it because even the bible itself does say you must test the scriptures you know um by questioning them you know so for us let us test our cultures even if it's it's in the english culture in the africans culture in in, in in our african cultures whichever the culture is let us ask these questions why are mm -hmm. things like this why is mom kneeling down when she's giving you food why should she do that? And, and we living in a in a much more um, uh, in a much more you know newer type of culture, and can we start new cultures where we can speak about these things? Because my my feeling is if the church cannot speak about these things in in the pulpit, then we won't have people going home. And speaking, and, about it and speaking about it and rethinking about it yeah. and saying, oh, wow, you know, I didn't think of this in that way. I didn't think of this in that way, right? Yeah. So, um, Kiara. Yeah. So what do you think? Do you think we can still just continue this conversation, but and still try to bring it up in the context of a church? so that it can be it can be solved in the homes yeah or, definitely or Sorry, do we yeah. still just keep quiet about it and say no but other homes have got different systems no i, th I definitely think it should be addressed in the church um, i'm so happy that we actually brought this topic up with the church because i think especially in the church we need to have good systems of accountability because mm. we've heard many church leadership you know, doing wrong things and then not cover it up, you know, even in the Methodist church and the wider Methodist church. So yeah. we, need, we need that accountability system where we stand upward, you know, where we stand up against the gender-based violence. We're like, no, you know, if you've done this, you're wrong. You must, yeah. you know, repent. And not just, you know, my opinion is that you repent in front of everyone. You yeah. Know? Uh, yeah. <laughs> but also um, to deviate a little bit is, I feel like also with the Bible, the Bible has used a lot, has been used a lot to sort of say, well, it's okay because the Bible says this and this and this. A woman must submit to her husband. Well, the wife must submit to her husband. And I think that has also worked against women a lot in history. But with that, the Bible says, then, you know, it's okay to do. <laughs> yeah, but, but with that verse, what, what a lot of, um, especially men, do is they say women should submit um uh, with uh, submit to their husbands but they don't they don't go further on to read where yeah, it says, yeah. husband you should love your wives and the only yeah. way your wife can submit to you is if you love her and that's yeah, how yeah. that's how it's supposed to be just like christ loved the church so for us to submit to to christ we need to love uh, Christ has to love us and we submit. Already Christ has shown us that life, uh, that love by sacrificing his own, his, his life for us, meaning he loves us. So if he loves us that in that way, we submit to him. So in the same way, men, we need to, as men, we need to uh, love our wives. We need to, uh, to, to sacrifice 
for our women so that they can submit to us in, in yeah. return. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that needs to be taught more. I remember, yeah. every, sorry, we're talking about my teen church. I, I spoke about that in teen church once, you know, I, you know, I've read further than what they knew about why wives submit to your husbands. And all, yes. my, all my boys were like, no, then we're not getting married. And I was like, no, guys, you can't have it your way. You have to have it both ways. You know, you also have yes. to submit to your wife. And yeah. Um, yes. So I think also in church, we should actually speak more about these scriptures, but then go into the, con- the context of it and what it really means. Yes. Not just leave it at the surface level. Yes. Yeah. Oh, thank you. And James? Uh, thanks. Uh, I think this will be like uh, my last comment and then okay. I think I need to go. Okay. Um, but I think a big thing for me, uh, to, to both personally uh, in my own experience, as well as just really thinking a lot about this topic and, and looking at it where it's at, is I think there is a dependency for all people, uh, both men and, and women, uh, to have some kind of mentorship. Yes. And for me, uh, in terms of, of uh, boyhood to manhood or, or manhood, just in, in line with that conversation, I think, and TK touched on it, I'm sad he's not here, but there is a definite need for society in general. It doesn't matter what household you're from, uh, where you're from, mm. everyone needs some kind of guidance. And something that I see that our church has, which I... I'm thankful for, and I think uh, reflects a lot on, um, you know, maybe perhaps where society could be lacking a little bit mm. is that's the that thing of of mentorship, of having someone that you can go to in an open place in a in a safe environment where you can say, hey, what what can I like? How do I do this? Yeah, is yeah. this bad? Is this good? And and I think there's a lot that comes from mentorship. Is you, you get that challenge, you get that guidance, you get that. Sometimes you get a no, and sometimes you get a yes. And it's those no's and yeses that help us grow, right? Yeah. Um. And and I think uh, not just uh, one-on-one mentorship, but um, I, I guess you could say corporate mentorship. So yes. the fellowship of of more than one. Uh, uh, in this case, men's group, if you want to call it that, um, yes. uh, where you're in a corporate environment and there might be someone of a certain opinion, but there's someone going to, you know, further down the line that's going to have a different opinion. So you're kind of exposed to a variety of, um, of in, you know, your the, the typical word in like manhood, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think creating a space where that is possible, I think could possibly be a way forward. And, and again, it doesn't just have to be a guy's group. It can be a woman's group. It can be a woman yeah. and guy's group. It, you know, it can be a variety of things, but with the intention of you have someone that you can look up to. Yeah. And, I, and I think that relationship, you know, the looking up and looking down and then looking forward, I guess you could say, uh, we're losing that. You know, if you look back in history, uh, history shows that when you grew up, you know, uh, 500 years ago, you grew up in a village. And yeah, you had your your parents in the village or in the town or whatever, but you had a community of people that you could look to for certain things. You didn't just learn from your family. And I think as, you know, we've modernized and, you know, technology is further and so on, I think in a sense... Uh, there's a huge need for that. And a lot of our younger generation inertly have that sense of, of looking up. But I think what ends up happening now is instead of having a physical community around you, you have a virtual community. Yeah. yeah. And it's, that impacts uh, how and what we learn. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much, James. Cool. Thanks so much for inviting uh, no, no. Oh, the conversation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, Dimpo, do you have any last remarks? Um, not really. Uh, yeah, thanks for uh, facilitating this, this conversation. Um, I think we did bring up some very vital issues. 
uh, my one hope is just that we can actually take this forward and implement it in some way and somehow you know, yeah. um, try to bring a change about um, and not to just leave it at the back of our heads but to yeah. actually bring it to the front constantly um, constantly challenge each other challenge other people as well mm. and yeah maybe maybe it starts with us maybe it starts with just our families you, yeah. know, you never know um, yeah okay oh, thank you thank you very much Dimpo. and Kara do you have any last remarks I did have but then I forgot so. <laughs> <laughs> no, but this this was really good. Um, it yeah. definitely needs to be spoken about more and implemented and acted on. You know, yeah. I think we tend to sort of just leave it there and then it, it's on pause and then something happens and then we all outrage. You know? Yes, yes. Yeah. I think yeah. we should actually we should actually have more of these, um, maybe even every week or every two weeks or something like that, just to you know to refresh and rethink and always find ways we we can you know we, we can move forward yeah yeah definitely uh, yeah and alex yeah i think i think just pretty much two things which have been said um one alvis like i honor you for this i think it was a very good initiative um which is brilliant so well done on that and then the second thing is just the case of this needs to be a repeated conversation and conversation that eventually goes into action. Um, yes. And if we, uh, and as you guys have said, if we continue having the conversation, it continues raising awareness and it leads to action. So I think that's just, you know, finally. So I honor you for that. And yeah, it was nice chatting to all of you. Thank, thank you, man. And Noma. Uh, okay, I remembered to unmute myself this time. <laughs> Thank you so much <laughs> for this um, conversation. Yeah, it was, uh, it was really mind opening, you know, just to hear different perspectives. Because, you know, with, you know, societal issues like this, all you have is your own head and your own thoughts about everything that's going on. So it was very, like, refreshing to just, you know, soak in um, different ideas and different action plans. It's, yeah, it's, it's giving me hope. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Now, th thank you very much. Thank you very much to everyone that has joined us. And um, oh, TK just said he had issues with his internet, so that's why he had to leave. And um, th thankful to James. Thank you, um, Noma, Alex, Kiara, Dimpo. Thank you very much uh, for joining us in this. Uh, we'll do some more conversations, and um, this is going to go to all, all, all your churches as well. It's not just going to be for us. So I'm hoping that we can just place it in every church's social media and everything so that people understand that it's not just a conversation amongst us, but it's a conversation amongst the, uh, you know, uh, every young person. And we want to see a, a change. We want to see a difference in our, in our, in our society. Right. Well, thank you very much. Eh? And God bless all of you. Mm -hmm.